Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and I'm also with the DGES at Carleton University. That's the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. Uh, it's quite late at night. I'm teaching a uh, course at Carleton this term. It's a first year physical geography course. So I haven't taught this course before. I've got about 90, uh, 95 students or so. And uh, just trying to get ahead with all my course prep and there's a midterm coming up. So that's why I'm walking home late at night. Last video I talked about carbon dioxide removal method leg like two of the proverbial bar stool. We need to slash emissions as leg one. We need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and get concentrations down to 350 parts per million. And we also need to um, deploy solar radiation management techniques to, it's actually quite simple. In order to cool the planet, we have to do it quickly. We need to put up some sort of reflective shield to cut back just a small percentage of the incoming solar radiation and that would allow the planet to cool buy us time to continue slashing emissions and removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So how do we do that? So I'm going to talk about a bunch of different concepts and ideas um, that will allow us to do that. So the first thing, quick and dirty method, I call it the anthropogenic arctic volcano. So. Whenever a large volcano goes off, it produces a lot of ash, but it's the sulfur dioxide that's most important for climate. If the volcano is large enough and powerful enough, it ejects this uh, sulfur dioxide and ash and things up into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere. Now in the upper atmosphere, things aren't rained out, so they tend to stay there for a long period of time and eventually they just settle out due to gravitational attraction to the Earth. This process, so the finest particles, the SO2, in either little droplets or little um, mass particles, depending on what they attach to, it can take three years for them to rain out. They act like little tiny mirrors in the upper atmosphere, reflecting some sunlight, causing the planet to cool. How do we know this? Well. Uh, Pinatubo in 1991, it um, cooled the global average temperature of the planet about 0 0.7 degrees Celsius. Multiply 1.8, so that's uh, to get Fahrenheit, I'm talking about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit or something. So basically this cooling occurred for up to about three years, you know, two, two to three years. So we could do this. Um, we could do this um, solar radiation management technique quite simply. For example, if we added sulfur to jet fuel of commercial aircraft, and um, many of these aircraft fly over the Arctic, and just a normal passenger aircraft flying at the altitude that they do, could inject sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. We could figure out how much. We could tailor it to cause a cooling, specifically of the Arctic, but then of course that sulfur dioxide would dissipate and spread across the planet. Now there's a couple downsides of this. This is the cheapest, quickest way of cooling the planet quickly to buy us some time to do the other two legs. But some of the downsides are that the SO2 stays up in the atmosphere um, and actually in the Arctic winter is still there. Of course the Arctic's in complete darkness 24 hours a day for three or four months. So in that time period there's no need for sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere above the Arctic because there's no sunlight there. However, what is there could actually stop some of the long wave radiation from escaping to space. So it could actually um, lead to a reduction of Arctic cooling, which is not what we want for the sea ice. So that's a drawback. And another thing that people talk about is they say that the monsoons could be affected. But I have to disagree with some of that because, you know, we want to restore the jet stream patterns to what they were before, and that would restore somewhat the monsoon. The idea is that, you know, if there's cooling, there's not enough contrast between the land and ocean temperatures. So that could reduce the monsoon. 
So there's some modeling that can be done. So this seems like the quickest and easiest thing to do, you know, to avoid the problem with uh, winter reduction of cooling, we could find a different particle to use, to put up into the stratosphere to cause the cooling little, to make these little mirrors. So there's some calcites that are very interesting. There's some research being done on that. And that would wash out of the stratosphere sooner and it wouldn't affect the ozone and it might possibly uh, be a lot better, safer technique. Um, you know, if it doesn't last as long in the upper atmosphere, then we could tailor the process to do the cooling in the summer and not worry about it so much in the winter. That's quite possible. Um, or we can make the albedo higher, the reflectivity of the earth higher near the surface or in the low, low troposphere. So one of the techniques that is very interesting is called the uh, MCB, marine cloud brightening. So this method would involve, for example, trying to make low level marine clouds brighter. So if you can make them brighter, something called the Tuomi effect. If you use smaller, if you get smaller water droplets, then they're much more highly reflective than larger water droplets. And you'd have a lot more of the smaller water droplets. And because they're smaller, they'd probably stick around longer. So some of the, some of the ways to do this marine cloud brightening is there's a very interesting technique that's being developed by Armand Neukermans um, in California. And his idea is to use, take seawater, run it through high pressure, pressure novels, nozzles. Um, salt crystals would come out of the spray and they would then be of the right size. You tell her the size so that they would uh, be perfect cloud condensation nuclei to brighten these low level clouds. So his idea is to do this off the coast of California to create fog actually, which will then come ashore and sustain the redwoods, which are severely stressed because fog events off the coast of California have reduced. So this is his idea, our man Neukermans. He's done some very, some great videos on this technique. Of course, a uh, world leader in this type of technology is Stephen Salter, who's a colleague of mine in the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. And he's got the idea of using drone ships or automated ships with large towers using uh, various effects for propulsion and solar power, etc. But basically the idea is the same, to move these ships in regions off, out, off outside the Arctic to create low level marine cloud, to reflect a lot of sunlight, to cool the ocean underneath. And this would be to cool the warm ocean in the Atlantic that is run up sort of the end of the Gulf Stream running up and then going into the Arctic to warm the Arctic and taking out sea ice. So these methods are some of the great methods um, that are very promising. And another thing you could do is instead of trying to brighten the clouds, you could brighten the surface of the ocean. So one way you might do that, oh, by the way, to generate more clouds, you could also, when a ship passes over the ocean, you know, it's burning the diesel, it creates a low level cloud that can persist for a long period of time. So one of the ideas is to, you know, if you put the, if you put some agents in the fuel, perhaps you could make these clouds with smaller particles that were more persistent and you, these clouds would last longer. Or another thing that you can do is to make the ocean surface itself brighter. So if you make these very, very tiny bubbles, then these bubbles stick around and can last a long period of time and they're highly reflective. So then you're making the surface of the sea, the dark ocean surface, brighter to reflect sunlight. You don't have to reflect too much on a global basis in order to have an effect on cooling uh, the planet. So these uh, micro bubbles are very interesting technology. Another interesting, some other interesting technologies are coming from Kevin Lister, who's a colleague of mine in the UK and uh, person, an engineer in Australia, Sev Clark, and they've got some very interesting ideas. In fact, three different ideas. One I talked about last video, 
and that was using ocean flakes to distribute nutrients over a long period of time on the surface of the ocean to simulate phytoplankton growth to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so that's a CDR method. And there's a couple of SRM methods, solar radiation management methods, that they're using. One is using something, a, a device called the fluidic oscillator to generate these very small particles, these very small salt crystals to do the marine cloud brightening. And perhaps it could be a lot lower energy, generate a lot more of these particles and be much better than the Neukermann method. The jury's out on that, I think. And another very interesting technique is to, is to actually, they're working on ways to make the ice thicker in the Arctic so it sticks around longer. In the far Canadian north, we have ice roads that are, in, that are, what, that are used throughout the winter. Of course, it's getting so warm there that these ice roads are harder to make and they don't last as long. Therefore, we can't truck supplies up to northern regions, northern communities, small communities, so it's much more expensive. We have to send the, uh, you know, we have to send aircraft in, way more expensive. So this technique, um, so often what they do is they take, they run pumps through the ice and they pump the cold water just below the ice to the surface of the ice where it freezes. Now, very simple, ice is a good insulator, so the uh, air temperatures can be cold and the ice is not freezing that thickly, that quickly because it's already thick and the thicker ice gets, the lower the ice formation rate. So this is just easy pumping water on the surface where it will freeze and you can keep doing this all winter and make really thick ice. So the idea is to do this in the Arctic and make these huge ice wedges. Uh, probably the infrastructure would work best if you picked an area on the shore. You know, you could have your big pumps, your energy sources, generate the ice and then set it into the drift current so that it flows into the Arctic. So we're basically creating thicker ice there. So this ice is highly reflective and uh, will help keep the Arctic cool. Um, you know, there's lots of different ideas like this. What are some of the other ones? Some of the other ones are more far-fetched. First of all, you know, the amount of sulfur to um, do the anthropogenic Arctic volcano is very small compared to the sulfur that we put out from coal burning power plants. But of course that sulfur goes up through smokestacks, stays in the lower atmosphere where it doesn't, you know, do its job. Or actually it does, but it rains out quickly. Anything in the lower atmosphere will rain out from weather in about a week to 10 days or something. That's the residence time. That's why, you know, putting stuff in the stratosphere makes a lot more sense because it stays there for a longer period of time where it's useful. So my hand's starting to freeze and I'm slowing down a bit, but let's see what else. Yes, so, so some of these uh, other techniques that are very interesting involve things that would be, you know, super expensive and much larger scale projects. So, you know, anything that reduces the sunlight coming to the earth would do the trick. So if we had very, very large balloons, for example, that were highly reflective and had fleets of these and, and uh, you know, ran some sort of reflective material between them, supported it, you know, that might do that might reflect, you know, we could tailor this thing to reflect sunlight in different locations, but this is, these are huge projects. Um, going further into space, um, if we put huge mirrors up in space in the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, so, or so that they would stay there, then if we tilted these huge mirrors, then they would, we could control the amount of sunlight getting through and we wouldn't have to block too much sunlight to basically have a cooling effect on the planet. But we're talking about projects like this that take, you know, have huge lead times, billions of dollar projects. So basically I think what the world will go to very soon when all of the, when the fan, proverbial fan stops running because it's caked with uh, excrement, um, we'll probably be, have, see these uh, SRM techniques deployed being the uh, sulfur, uh, the anthropogenic Arctic volcano. Anyway, thank you for your time.